says, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. His decrees are very trustworthy and holiness befits his house. It's to this mighty Lord that we sing now the words of this psalm. Psalm 93, we'll find that in our blue books. The Lord is King Supreme. Let's pray together. Lord God, we're pleased to come together as your people and worship you this evening. And we're privileged to be able to call ourselves your people, to belong to you who placed the stars into space, to you who created the sea and all the land. Lord, we're privileged beyond what we can imagine to belong to you. For you are awesome in might, full of majesty, and your glory is displayed throughout this world. You reign over all that is around us, so that nothing, no one, can undermine your purposes, your plans for your church. We can trust that you will put all your enemies under your footstool. We can trust that you have raised Jesus up to the place of highest honor from which he will place all things under his just and righteous reign. So Lord, as we're joined together this evening to praise you, to pray to you, and to hear you speak, we ask that you would enliven our hearts to respond to you and all that you have done and all that you are. Many, O Lord, are your wonderful works. We praise you that even though we are lowly and needy, that you don't overlook us, that we can look to you to speak and be loving to us. 
Lord, we know that even though we come to you with much sin, with much that would dishonor you, that we can also come with hope, with confidence, that we can come expectantly for you have more mercy and more grace than we can fathom. Lord, quicken us this evening where we're apathetic. Minister to us from your might that we might be more sure of who you are and that we might be more sure of what you are working to achieve in this world in the end. That we would be more sure of Christ's security as he through his cross has become the true temple through which we can commune with you minister to us that we would be more sure of Christ's authority so that we will trust his words that never spoil, fade, or pass away. And minister to us that we would embrace all that you prioritize, all that you purpose, so that we would live for you each day. For you and you alone are the supreme king who's able to bring these things to fruition, who's able to grant grace and grant mercy to those who would otherwise be helpless. So we're confident you're amongst us this evening and we cry out to you to minister to us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to our service here at uh, Tron Central. If you're visiting with us, we hope you feel particularly welcome. And we'd love for you to stay behind afterwards, after we have communion, uh, to enjoy some tea and coffee that should be served in here and to get to know those around us. Let's all be using that time afterwards to meet and greet, maybe to uh, introduce yourself to someone you don't really know and to try and encourage uh, our brothers and sisters. Uh, you might have got uh, one of these sheets this morning. If not, uh, there's some just on the stalls on the way out. You can have a look at that at your leisure. Uh, just two things to point out. Uh, this week, we're having our congregational meeting. Uh, we tend to have one once a year, and it'll be on Wednesday evening right here at Tron Central uh, from 7.30. So please do make every effort uh, to come along to that. Uh, we'll be looking back on the past year and uh, thinking ahead uh, to the next year. Secondly, uh, this week there's going to be no lunchtime Bible talk on Wednesday. Uh, we have the Servants of the Word conference that Cornhill run uh, being hosted here. Uh, do uh, keep that in your prayers this week. There's over 100 people coming to be equipped and encouraged uh, to keep going with gospel ministry. Uh, so be praying uh, for Willie and Dick and Simon as they're the main speakers this week. Uh, there's more information in these sheets. Now let's uh, turn to our Bible reading for this evening. We're returning again to uh, the little uh, book of Haggai. And we're going to be reading chapter 2, verses 10 uh, to 19. It's right towards the end of the Old Testament. We've seen that the Israelites who were able to return to the promised land had neglected to build the temple. Uh, so Haggai had spoken to them to explain that their struggles were curses from God. But once they'd returned to work, God reassured them of his presence with them. And he promised them last week a temple of even greater glory to come. And now, verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priests answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. 
and so with every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onwards, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with heal, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the, white, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing but... From this day on, I will bless you. Amen. This is God's word. We turn to sing again in our blue books, hymn number 568, a hymn which reminds us what God's intention is for his people in this world. Church of God, elect and glorious, holy nation, chosen race. Five, six, eight. as the musicians play, the offering is going to be collected. You might want to use uh, this time to read again this passage that we'll study or to refresh yourself on what's already come in Haggai.
Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have been given so much by you. Chief of all, we've been given the Lord Jesus. But we've also but have also received all that we have from your hand. And so it's with glad thanksgiving that we give these gifts to you, praying that you will use them to extend your kingdom throughout the whole world. For it is a world in dire need of your grace. We live in a world that is in perpetual confusion about what is right and good, a world where your kingdom is the last thing on many people's agenda. So, Lord, we pray particularly this week for the conference that's happening. We pray for all who will be involved in servants of the word as delegates, that you would be granting them ever-growing confidence in your word as the means of bringing real transformation. Oh, how this country needs many faithful saints with steel in their spines who will be prepared to teach and preach and proclaim the wonders of your word no matter what it costs, so that your church will be built and your son, its foundation, its cornerstone will be brought great glory. This country needs many who know how to faithfully hold out your life-giving word to a lost, broken, and hurting world. So we're pleased that such a conference can happen, and Lord, we pray Uh, We pray on for the work of Cornhill and all that they do in equipping Bible teachers, for the work that Edward and Charles and the others faithfully do. But this week particularly, we pray for the hundred plus who will be coming along. We pray that they would be better equipped from spending the week here, that they would find encouragement for the task that they have to do, that there'd be a growing unity amongst those who love your gospel and want to see your church built in Scotland. So we pray that you would be particularly with Simon and Dick and Willie this week as they prepare and teach at the conference. Give them clarity of thought, confidence as they speak, that they would be a real blessing to all who come along. Lord, we pray to you for us as a church that you would continue to allow us to train many people for this same work, and that as a congregation, we too would be doing all that we can to build your church in this world so that nothing would come as a priority above that. Equip us for this task as we turn to your word this evening. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we do turn to God's word, we sing from our books again, hymn number 556. Jesus, master at your word, we're gathered all to hear you.
do turn again in your Bibles to Haggai chapter 2. We find suspense often a hard thing to deal with. For those of us who are familiar with Netflix, you'll know the sweet relief of the next episode playing automatically. No more need to wait for a week to find out what's going to happen after the cliffhanger. No, no, suspense done away with. But the Israelites of Haggai's day had to deal with a lot of suspense. There was the question of what the temple they were supposed to be rebuilding would look like in the end. Would it be anything like what had gone before? And after last week's prophecy, who knows at what point the greater glory of the latter temple will exceed the former. When, if at all, will he see it? But there was another great deal of suspense to contend with. In chapter 1, it had been spilt out to Israel that their frustrations at harvest time were all at the hand of God. Their labors produced little. That's what Haggai declared to the people in the midst of their strife. Haggai told them that it was God who had brought it upon them. Chapter 1, verse 9. You looked for much, and it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Then chapter 1, verse 11, I have called for a drought on the land, hills, grain, and all the rest. The cause of this was that the temple was lying in ruins, and God was placing curses on Israel. So they heard God's voice, and they've responded by now. The rebuild is underway, and there was an encouragement from God because of this. But what would come of the next harvest? Israel were in suspense to know if the curses they were under would indeed end. Would the small harvest turn into something better? And as God's word came again to Haggai, this time on the 24th day of the ninth month, the suspense will only end at the very last few words of this prophecy. Before the reassurance of God's kindness, in verse 19, there needs to be some further explanation of what has happened. And that's what we have in the first two points this evening, before a line is finally drawn under the whole ordeal as we move to the third point. So we have first, in verses 10 to 14, the infectiousness of ignoring God. Second, in verses 15 to 17, we have rebellion repaid with ruin. And then in verses 18 to 19, we have building leads to blessing. So first, the infectiousness of ignoring God. If we refuse to bow the knee to God in a single area of our lives, then no matter how many other Christian things we do, they're stained by that refusal to listen to God. If we get on well with other Christians and we attend regularly to church and all the rest, but don't take Jesus seriously and we aren't concerned with building his church, then that undermines everything else. To turn it into a maths equation, say your life is made up of 10 parts and in nine of those you're gladly submitting yourself to God's word, but in one you aren't and won't. Even when you're confronted about it, you won't heed God's word, then that one part corrupts all the others. Building God's church is an area that mustn't be neglected like that one part. Nine tenths of a life in submission to God is not a life in submission to God. That single area contaminates everything else. All efforts at holiness will be undermined if we ignore God's true temple, the Lord Jesus, and if we ignore his church that he's building in this world. By this time in Haggai, work has begun again on the temple. In fact, we're now exactly three months on from the day Israel responded to the first prophecy and got back to work. This date on its own doesn't seem as significant maybe as some of the other uh, dates we've seen. However, it was now the time of year of looking forward to harvest, hoping for good returns. The seed had been planted, and nothing else could be done. We'll come back to that later. 
But the other significant timing in this passage is that it is a word from God at the time of verse 18, the laying of the foundation of the temple. This is a key juncture for the restoration. And so God speaks again to bring clarity to Israel about what has happened and why. Not that anything of what, what's happened already should have come to, as a surprise to them. God has simply been doing as he said he would in the law. The curses shouldn't have been a surprise. But it ought to serve as a further warning for the future to not repeat the same mistakes. It is, after all, the priests who Haggai is addressing in this passage. They were the teachers of the law. And it's no coincidence that this passage comes between two prophecies of future victory for God's kingdom and his people. Last week's greater temple that is to come. And then next week we'll see is another promise of victory. So in between these two promises for the future, we have this warning. And if the priests are clear on what has happened, then that would help Israel to not get caught up in what is yet to come to the point that they neglect what they're meant to be doing in the present. This would serve as a further warning for Israel to heed. And so Haggai asks two questions of the priests. They seem obscure to us. We don't really consider much about food being unclean or clean, certainly not in any spiritual sense. The first question, verse 12, if someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and then touches any other food with that garment, would the other food then become holy too? Now, in this day, uh, they wouldn't have had their nice airtight Tupperware containers or even a little sandwich bag to carry their leftovers in. They would have wrapped their food up to carry it, a bit like putting it in a pocket. So does the holiness of the food pass through that garment and make other food holy too? That's the question. Now, this specific scenario doesn't present itself in Leviticus 7 with all the similar laws, but it's pretty straightforward for the priests to conclude from these principles that the answer is no. No, holiness is not transferable in that way. So question two, verse 13. What about if someone has touched a dead body and so becomes unclean because of that? If they touch the food, does the food then become unclean? Yes, it does. Holiness doesn't necessarily spread by touch, but uncleanness does. So much so that if the holy and the unholy touch it's the holy that becomes contaminated. Think about it as a rotten apple in a bowl. It ruins the others, not the other way around. Or in our staff offices, when someone comes down with a cold, as happens every winter, or the latest vomiting bug, we don't put them in a room with all the people who are well and healthy in the hope that that will get rid of the bug. No, no, I stay as far away as possible, and if they shake my hand, I'm straight uh, to the kitchen to wash it. Unholiness, sin, uncleanness, those are the things that are infectious and contagious, not the other way round. With that established, Haggai then lands his punch in verse 14. So it is with this people, this nation before me, every work of their hands, all that they offer here at the temple is unclean. In mythology, King Midas was able to turn anything that he touched into gold. And so we often talk about the Midas touch when someone's able to bring success to what they do. But here, Israel have the anti-Midas touch. Everything they touch, all that they do with their hands, even bringing offerings, are tainted and stained. Or to put it another way, the temple that lay in ruins was like a corpse in their midst. And as it lay there, it polluted the people so that nothing they could do was holy. It wasn't the temple itself that infected them. But as it lay there untouched, unfinished, uncared for, it showed that Israel had put their fingers in their ears and they were ignoring God. It showed that their own endeavors mattered more than God's kingdom. Their own paneled houses 
over God's house. And so as the temple was in their midst like that, it was the siren that was ringing and saying, these people are unclean. Everything they do is unclean. This people are in rebellion before God. Notice again in verse 14, they haven't stopped offering sacrifices, but what they do offer is now unclean. Israel wouldn't have claimed to be rebelling against God. They were still doing religious activities, still arriving at the rubble of the temple and offering their observance. But it was all stained by the fact that they hadn't submitted to God. This is an uncomfortable truth to have pressed home. But can't it be common for us to create metaphorical or imagined stacks of the things that we do? On one side of the things that we do for God, it's a nice, tall stack. We do lots of that. And then there are things on the other side that we're aware that we shouldn't be doing or that maybe we should be doing and we're, we're not. When we look at the stacks, we think, that big one makes everything okay. We might be aware that, okay, this one area pulls us down a little bit, but we'll tell ourselves that it's okay to, to keep doing it. If we're comparing the stacks, it's 90%, 95%, 98% doing the right thing, trying to submit to God, living to please Him. But the truth is that disinterest in building the church cannot be overlooked. Now, there might be some of those things in our favor that we know we don't always do perfectly, but we're striving to, we want to, we long to. But nonetheless, it's the unwillingness to submit in the 1%, the thing in the negative stack, where we're disinterested in what Christ wants most, that stains everything else. That's what shows where our hearts really are. That's what's been exposed in Israel. Bring all the offerings you like. Take communion as much as you like. Put as much money in the offering, as you plate, offering plate as you like. Come to church every week even. But if you won't submit to God in everything, if his kingdom and his church won't come first, if the true temple, the Lord Jesus, is not giving, given everything then that corrupts all else. The obedience of faith must be pervasive, all-encompassing, so that we want to live for Christ with all that we have. And that doesn't mean that from now on we are to live in perfection, of course not, but it must mean that we're prepared to let the Word of God work in us, that we're prepared to listen to rebuke and to prioritize God's kingdom and his priorities. If we don't, if we're not willing to, then that is the corpse that will spread, spread on cleanness throughout. Maybe we won't want to give up a relationship with someone we know that isn't right, one that pulls us away from giving Jesus everything. Friends, small group leaders try to talk to us about it, but it's off limits. And then we have divided loyalties. We're trying to play in two camps. We try to play our part at church, do the right things. But all the while, the relationship trumps the temple. It's more important than God's kingdom. When the crunch comes, it's the relationship. Prioritizing instead what we want over what God has said. My temple building, as we've seen the past couple of weeks, is building with living stones. We're not building uh, a building with bricks and wood. We're building the church, the body of Christ. So perhaps some of us are happy to come to church, to take communion. But when it comes to playing our part, we don't really have an interest. We certainly wouldn't want to push ourselves to be involved in the ministry of the church. There are plenty of others who could do that. I just want a nice sermon. I want to sing my favorite hymns, say my prayers, talk to my friends, and come back again next week. 
Well, be careful. Israel were told that their unwillingness to listen to God about prioritizing Him meant that their offerings were unclean. If we refuse to bow the knee to Jesus for the sake of His kingdom, then no matter how many other Christian things we do, they will be stained by that refusal to listen to God. And Haggai goes on to spell out the further consequences of that. Verses 15 to 17, he goes on to say that rebellion is repaid with ruin. Ultimately, refusing to bow the knee to God on anything will result in the experience of curses. The prophets were sent to bring Israel back from the brink. They were sent to reinforce the covenant that was made at Sinai. Israel were told to circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Do not harden your hearts. But Israel had warnings about the temple ruins in their midst and how that made them unclean. Haggai wasn't the first way that God was calling them to repent in this. Look at verse 15. Before stone was placed upon stone in the temple, how did you fare? Whilst the temple was ignored, how did you fare? We've seen a bit of this already in chapter 1. They faced curses. At the end of their labors, they only experienced frustration. Verse 16, when it looked like they might have a harvest yield of 20 measures, it was only 10. When it looked like it might be 50 measures, it was only 20. Their work ended in ruin. All that they did was met with verse 17, toil, blight, mildew, and heal. Clear signs of judgment. Israel would have known from their history what was happening. Yet, verse 17 you did not turn to me. Their failure to listen was a rebellion. Their failure to prioritize their lives around God and his priorities was a rebellion. And it was met with curses. If we let God's word wash over us, if we refuse to listen and follow and respond, if we're unconcerned with seeing the church built, and Jesus honored, then the future for us is frustration and toil, futility and turmoil. And these curses are but a taste of what it will be like if we won't listen to him. That is frightening. Jesus is the true king of this world. He has offered peace terms to us. He's reached out his hand with the offer of peace, offering to spare us a terrible future if we're loyal to him, if we trust him, if we follow him, if we listen and respond to him in faith and take seriously what he's asked us to do. But if we don't, if we think we know better, if we think he can be king of 99% of us, that we can have our religious devotion, that he can have our religious devotion, but not our sacrificial commitment to building his church, not our wholehearted commitment to the Lord Jesus. And whatever that looks like, then we are rebelling against the king who will destroy all that is evil and wrong. That is frightening. If we are more interested in assembling things for our own amusement, in building our bank balances, constructing our careers, so that we neglect the necessary work that God has given to us, then these things might be a corpse in our midst that stains everything else that we do. This serves as a stark warning that ought to be heeded. But that wasn't the end of the story. It certainly wasn't the end of the story in Haggai's day, and it doesn't need to be the end of the story today. For Haggai finishes by saying, verses 18 to 19, building leads to blessing. God can bring fruitfulness from frustration. When God's word is heard and responded to, then frustration turns to fruitfulness. There is restoration, and we remember that particularly this evening as we celebrate communion. 
the end of the story doesn't have to be ruined. What was it that changed things here? Verse 18. It was the day that the foundation of the temple was laid. Israel kneeled their colors to the mast. They responded in faith. The foundation of the temple signaled their intent to respond wholeheartedly to him. That's the turning point in all of this. Verse 15, consider before stone was placed upon stone in the temple, it was calamity, hardship, fruitlessness, ruin. But, verse 18, since the day that the cornerstone, the foundation stone was laid, from that day on, verse 19, God says, I will bless you. When we heed his word and respond to him, then we don't need to fear judgment or ruin. As we listen to him, and his word works in us so that we're happy to give up an evening to invest in students, so that we're happy to give generously of our time and our money for the work of the gospel. That proves that we're not afflicted with the anti-Midas touch. Israel had a privileged heritage At Sinai, God made a covenant with them that gave them the status as his treasured possession. They, amongst all the other nations, were his treasured possession. But with that, Israel were to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They had great privilege, but that didn't get them a free pass on listening to God. They were to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. They were to display to the world what their God was like, to be holy as God was holy. They were to minister to the world the blessings of God. How could Israel be holy? How could Israel possibly be a kingdom of priests when they're happy to let the temple lie in ruins in their midst? They were happy to build, and build they did, but chapter 1 verse 4, it was building their own lovely paneled houses. But now that they had heard God's word, now that they had responded to him in the 24th day of the ninth month, as they laid the foundation of the temple, they had committed again to building God's kingdom, to being faithful to him, to playing their part in all that God has purposed. The date is significant as well because it wasn't just the day of the foundation being laid It was also the point in the year when all the seed was already out and been planted. Verse 19, is the seed yet in the barn? At this time of year, the answer to that would have been no. Their experience of curses has meant that previously the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing. And here is the suspense that Israel faced. The seed is no longer in the barn. It's out, it's planted cast for another year. But what was going to happen? More heal? More blight? More mildew? No, none of that. From this day on, I will bless you. Say goodbye to the anti-Midas touch. Now, from any human perspective, it was far too early to tell what was going to happen with the crops. Even the most experienced farmer couldn't predict it. But the word of the Lord has come, and as sure as the curses came for ignoring him, so sure will be the blessing for responding to him. And just as the curses that Israel faced were a foretaste of the greater curse that is to come for those who harden their hearts to God, so too is this blessing a foretaste of the greater blessing that is to come. Israel could at this point with confidence anticipate a fruitful harvest and prosperity because God had said, I will bless you. And we too, through our true temple, can anticipate with this, that same certainty greater prosperity than even Israel had at their high point. When they had taken Canaan, when they had David's greater son Solomon, when they had his grand temple even when they knew real material flourishing, all of that 
was a foretaste of the ultimate blessing and the ultimate fulfillment of God's covenant. For we have a greater temple. We have the greatest son of King David. And we look forward to the kingdom that will never fade or spoil, that will never be shaken, where all that, was in, all that is in it will only be fruitful. God says, I will bless you. That's why we must heed God's word that calls us to be builders and participate in the ways that we can. For some of us, that might feel small, but as Simon was encouraging us this morning, we all have a job. Each day we wake up and think, today is a day where I can serve God and do my bit. And as we do so, each sacrifice that we make to do that, whether it costs us a career, a comfortable retirement, or whether it costs us the lifestyle that we've always dreamed of, each of these sacrifices are part of us as a church nailing our colors to the mast, responding in faith to God. And they are evidence that his word is at work in us. And so he says, with greater clarity, with greater certainty to us, I will bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do give you great thanks for the Lord Jesus, for all that he has achieved for us, for all that his life and death and resurrection means that we have a wonderful hope in store. Work in us that nothing would be of more significance, nothing would be a greater pull on our desires, on our time, on our affections than the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We respond to this by singing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, number 453. Notice the last verse. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, Love so amazing, so divine, it demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's sing. <laughs>
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And what a difference his grace makes, the mess that we are in when we're left to ourselves. But the wonderful transformation when his temple is a living presence in the midst, the place where God dwells among his people. Now for us in the person of our Lord Jesus, who is the temple, and who places himself in the midst of us and reminds us that for all our shortcomings, for all our failings, for all our weaknesses, for all our inadequacies, he is more than sufficient. So listen to his words. Come to me, he says, all who labor and all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He calls us not to be slaves, but sons, receivers of his grace. I am the bread of life, he says. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Your barns will be full. Your needs will be met with the bread of life. And so the Lord Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, knowing that they have none, knowing that they cannot find it themselves, knowing that there's no place on this earth where they can find what they need. But here's what he says, those who hunger and thirst for that righteousness, they will be filled. Filled by our gracious Savior's provision. So the Apostle Paul says to us, I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, take, eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as a remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after the supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is, you proclaim it to one another as we pass the bread and the wine. These visible words are teaching us, reminding one another of the great sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for our sins. As we take in our hands, as we take into our own bodies, in the closest way imaginable, we're reminding ourselves of the reality, just as these things are real in our hands, of what he has done for us. But above all, as we do this, we remind God himself, and we are saying to the Lord, remember your promises sealed in the blood of your precious son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what you covenanted once and for all on that day, so that you can say to us, from that day forward, from the day the Lord's temple was established forever in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, I will bless you. And we come to the Lord each one of us to this table today, unable to say we have kept the faith 100%. Unable to say there are not areas of our life which have not been as they ought to be. Unable to say so many things that we would want to say about our life of faith and trust in him. But as we take this bread and as we drink this wine, we remind you, our Heavenly Father, that you've promised that this is enough, even for our greatest insufficiency, that you've promised not only to be merciful, but to be just in forgiving our sin, because our Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price. That price cannot be paid again. A great transaction is done. And so we come in faith and in trust 
in this great memorial which assures and reassures our hearts of the Lord's great promise to us to keep us in everlasting life. And so as the Lord Jesus gave thanks and prayed, so as we come to his table and to his feast, let's turn to prayer and give thanks as well. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, how we thank you for the sufficiency of our great Savior. And now this table reminds us that once and for all and forever, never to be repeated, never needing to be repeated, you have done what we could never do and established forever this new covenant in your blood. And so it points us forward to all that still lies before us as we wait with great anticipation in the hope in which we are saved of the fullness of our salvation when at last, like the Lord Jesus, we are raised to life like him in new bodies, never to be decaying, never to be destroyed, into a new life, never again to be plagued by sin or by Satan and to a future of loving and serving you wholeheartedly, whole bodily, completely and forever. But until that day, Lord, we thank you for the great reassurance that this spread table brings to our hearts now to remind us that you are the one who never will leave us or forsake us, who's promised to be with us always, even to the end of this age. And so, Lord, we ask that you would enable us to eat and drink by faith, and so truly to receive the great reassurances that you want to give to our hearts this night, that we are yours and you are ours. And so it shall be because of our Lord Jesus forever and ever, come what may. So hear us, Lord, and draw near to us, we pray, we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. According, therefore, to the holy institution and the example and indeed the command of our Lord Jesus, we now do this. He, on the same night in which he's betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as a memorial of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So now as the servers come and serve you, if you take the bread and eat as you're given, take the cups and hold them. And then when we're all served, we'll drink together as one. Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know that we are dust. You know our frailty. You know the weakness of our faith. You know that we're tempted to look within ourselves. And when we do, we see so much that would tell us that we will never make it as your people. How we thank you that you spread this table before us to turn our eyes out and up and back and forward, to 
to remind us that it's all you and it's all your grace. So, Lord, send us on our way, we pray, greatly reassured of your great promise of blessing. And send us out into the world filled with joy, that message to proclaim that there is a way back, a way back to God from the dark paths of sin, from all that has hindered us. There is a door that is open and all may go in and that at Calvary's cross is where it begins when we come as sinners to Jesus. Fill our hearts with this glorious truth we pray and guide our steps as we walk in his way. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to end by singing number 900. To him whose power is able to protect even our stumbling feet and prepare our souls for glory, there with joy our King to meet. Number 900. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. <laughs>